pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we're going to start today with a uh, resolution for one of our long-term stars who is uh, moving into retirement. Uh, obviously, there's times for coming and going, and uh, certainly Sylvia Bender has, has over m more than 30 years, so uh, all of us wish her well. I'm going to start reading a, a resolution, uh, and then we'll uh, talk about it. Uh, while whereas Sylvia Bender has spent more than 30 years in public service working for the state of California and in that time has demonstrated a strong commitment to excellence and diligence on behalf of Californians. And whereas Sylvia began working with the state in November 1988 with the California Department of Conservation. And whereas on March 1995, Sylvia began her career with the California Energy Commission in the Energy Efficiency Division in the Efficiency Technology Office as an Associate Energy Specialist before becoming an Energy Efficiency Specialist in April 1998. She was promoted in July 2000 to an Energy Commission Supervisor 1 in the Forecasting Office and then an Energy Commission Supervisor 2 in September 2001. And whereas during the energy crisis of 2000 to 2001, the state took steps including media campaigns, business involvement, efficiency programs, and code changes to reduce peak demand by 5,000 megawatts for the summer of 2001 to avoid su supply dis disruptions. Sylvia recognized that the crisis and its aftermath offered a unique opportunity to gather information about consumers and organization response to events and programs and to analyze energy, uh, to analyze conservation decision making and the persistence of behavioral change. She initiated and guided research that provided valuable insights into strategies for future efforts to influence energy use and conservation. And whereas Sylvia started working in the Demand Assessment Office as a supervisor in July 2005, beginning her illustrative work in the Electricity Supply Analysis Division, and whereas Sylvia became manager of the Demand Analysis Office in the Energy Assessment Division in September 2005, then Deputy Director for 11 years starting in August of 2007. She was the only Deputy Director to lead the Energy Assessments Division, initially the Electricity Supply Analysis Division since its creation in July 2008 by merging the Demand Analysis and Electricity Analysis Units of other divisions. Her division's work includes conducting assessments of California's electricity and natural gas systems, providing end use demand forecasts and estimating conservation impacts and conducting objective technical analysis and modeling to understand the vulnerabilities and inform policy analysis. And whereas Sylvia, as the Energy Commission's point person for the Joint Agency Steering Committee, helped guide the integration alignment of the Energy Assessments Division's analytical work with that of the California Public Utilities Commission, California Air Resources Board, and the California Independent System Operator, to ensure a more efficient and effective resource planning process in California. And whereas Sylvia has a high level of integrity, her technical and technical expertise is unparalleled. She is able to grasp both the big picture and the details. She excels at making the complicated work ex understandable to a wide audience. And whereas Sylvia's dedication to her staff is well known. Therefore, therefore it be it resolved that the California Energy Commission recognizes and thanks Sylvia Bender for her distinguished record and professional contributions to the well-being of the citizens of California, and for her suburb accomplishments throughout the many years of service she has given to the Energy Commission and to the people of the state of California. The Energy Commission congratulates Sylvie Bender on her retirement and wishes her good health and happiness and all the best in her future endeavors.
Sylvia, do you want to come up and say a few words? Please. On. There, now we're on. Um, I want to thank you all for having given me this opportunity back in whenever it was, 1995, um, to start a career that had so many different kinds of challenges and so many different opportunities. And I think the most important thing about it was that it offered me something new to learn probably every single day that I was here. So to me, that was one of the most important things was in fact, I remember when I first came here, when I interviewed for the position, when they offered me a, a, a job preparing an evaluation plan for the commission's efficiency programs, the first thing I wanted to know is, is this really something you haven't done before? It's not something where it's already all set out? Because I said, I don't want to just you know, do something where the process is already set. I want to try something new and different. And, and that's really what the commission has enabled me to um, have a chance to try. And I certainly want to acknowledge the staff. Um, in the Energy Assessments Division. They are the ones that do the forecast, collect the data, do the analysis um, that really enables us all to know where California is on its path toward decarbonization policies and where we're going to be in the future. So I thank you very much, and I certainly acknowledge my staff as well for all their contributions to this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Why don't you come up here and we'll come down and give you the resolution, have a photo opportunity. You may want to follow up with a photo opportunity outside with your staff. Yeah. I have to say, it's really hard for me to envision Sylvia as an entry-level person. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and then I also wanted to say, Sylvia, you know, the, uh, the energy efficiency EM&V is the gift that keeps on giving, right? <laughs> Still doing that after all these years. Okay. So let's start with the consent calendar. Move approval of consent. Second. Actually, let's wait. Is, do, do we have any comments on the consent calendar? Either in the room or on the line? Oh, okay. No, let, let's go forward. Move again. Move, again. Uh, move, move again. approval of consent. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Consent calendar is approved uh, 5 to 0. Thank you. Let's go on to item 2. All right, good morning, Chair Weisenmuller and Commissioners. My name is Ingrid Neumann, and I'd like to present today on the 2019 updates to Title 24, Part 11, the California Green Building Standards. To put all of this into context, I'm showing here all the parts of Title 24, which is the California Building Standards Code. Our office is 
responsible for developing the mandatory building energy efficiency standards, which are found in part six, highlighted here in blue, as well as the voluntary portions of the building energy efficiency standards found in part 11, which we will discuss today. The part six for uh, update for tw the 2019 standards was adopted in May of this year. This is the table of contents for the California Green Building Standards Code, otherwise known as CalGreen. There are many pieces in here which are mandatory, which our agency does not contribute to. We contribute the voluntary portions of the building energy efficiency standards found in Appendix 4 and 5, which are respectively the residential and non-residential portions. So as the name implies, these are voluntary. Uh, they may be adopted by local jurisdictions seeking to reach beyond the mandatory standards found in Part 6, and that's done via the local ordinance approval process. Pieces that uh, have to do with the building energy efficiency standards, if a local jurisdiction that chooses to adopt those, those go to us for approval before going to CBSC. So moving on into Appendix 4, these are the residential voluntary measures. You can see that we are using an EDR metric, that's the energy design rating metric, that we're using for the mandatory portions in Part 6, starting in the 2019 standards. Those will be com come into effect January 1st of 2020. So we're using that same EDR metric for Part 11. You can see on the bottom that the 2016 energy efficiency target uh, then you would go on to the more stringent 2019 energy efficiency target, and then there's a PV target on top of that. And then the voluntary portions here that we're discussing today in Part 11 reach beyond those, and they have two tiers, just as the rest of CalGreen does for the voluntary portions. They have two tiers that local jurisdictions can reach towards. So same type of structure as the rest of uh, CalGreen, we have prerequisites before meeting those tiers. We are retaining the quality insulation installation prerequisite and doing a pick one approach, like a menu of other prerequisite options that uh, one can choose from, which include roof deck insulation or ducts and conditioned space, high performance walls, a HERS verified compact hot water distribution system, a HERS verified drain water heat recovery system. Any EDR improvements obtained by choosing one or, one or more of these prerequisites are counted towards the tier one or tier two targets. So the tier one and tier two targets are found in these tables. They are separated out by climate zone and depend on the fuel type of the resident. You can see that we reached an EDR of zero for most climate zones in tier two, and then we chose to go halfway between the mandatory EDR value required in part six and the target EDR value in tier two for part one, or sorry, for tier one. Lastly, we struck the performance approach for additions. Now we're moving on to appendix five which are the non-residential voluntary measures. Again, we keep that menu approach for the prerequisites. We are asking to choose one for tier one and two for tier two. We are retaining the outdoor lighting with a slight modification, as well as the service water heating and restaurants, and have added the following prerequisite options. Warehouse dock seal doors, daylight design power adjustment factors, exhaust air heat recovery systems. And again, any improvements here from impl implementing one or more of those prerequisites would count towards the more efficient goal for the tier one or tier two targets. So here we're retaining the percent better than mandatory language. So there's a compliance value and then for a tier one and tier two, we are saying that you would be a certain percent better or more efficient than that compliance value. And that language is the same as in the 2016 standards. So the target percentages continue to vary depending on whether lighting 
and or mechanical systems are included for non-residential building pro projects. So if one of the systems is included, the tier one target is 5%, but if both are, then it's 10%, and the same for tier two would be 10 and 15% respectively. We did make one change here. So for uh, the high rise residential and hotel motel projects, the indoor lighting uh, standards for the 2019 standards have become stringent and we recognize that there's very little improvement to be achieved there. So those projects essentially become mechanical improvements only. So that those tier one and tier two targets have been adjusted accordingly. Thank you. This concludes my presentation of the 2019 update to the voluntary building energy efficiency standards. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you. Let's take public comment. Let's start with those in the room. Bob Reamer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I'm Bob Raymer, uh, Senior Engineer with the California Building Industry Association. Uh, and the short story is we support adoption of your Part 11 provisions today. Uh, we worked a lot with staff. Uh, a number of uh, changes were made at our request. Uh, in particular, uh, the staff has uh, uh, added a paragraph requesting uh, when you're adopting either Tier 1 or Tier 2 at the local level that you engage with the local utility. Uh, you're going to see an increase in the amount of solar going into the grid. We want to make sure that the grid infrastructure is set up for that, uh, which most ut utilities are involved in these local adoption. Uh, there was also a request to uh, split apart uh, the uh, HERS verified compact water distribution system uh, from the drain waste uh, heat recovery so you have four prerequisites to choose from as opposed to just three uh, and uh, staff did that uh, and lastly uh, in the non-residential provisions uh, the portion related to uh, light pollution uh, we had a concern that uh, uh, there needed to be some exceptions allowed and indeed uh, staff has put in uh, a, a provision indicating that the exceptions that are currently allowed for outdoor lighting pollution uh, in part six uh, specifically section 140.7a uh, etc uh, are allowable we are requesting an editorial change uh, that provision I just spoke about uh, is indicated in the form of a note uh, in Title 24, like in the building code, uh, we use notes as uh, informative in nature, edu educational. Uh, for example, uh, in Part 11, HCD uses a note to indicate that you can go to the State Water Resources Control Board website to get more information on stormwater management. Uh, DSA references uh, in a note uh, the Department of Justice's disabled accessibility provisions uh, for more information there. Uh, in this extent, as far as the CEC's adoption in uh, the non-residential portion, the note is actually an exception. Uh, and in the verbiage of the note, it says the color temperature requirements is not ex uh, applicable to the applications identified in exceptions, too. And so what we would just simply request is that you change the word note to exception, which we would view uh, as editorial in nature. Lastly, uh, the BSC plans to do adoptions on December 4th and 5th. Uh, we'll be there to support adoption of both Part 6 and Part 11. So thank you. And unless you've got any questions, that's my testimony. Actually, let, let's go through all the comments in our staff to Thank respond you. to the editorial comments. Uh, Michael Stone, Nima. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Mike Stone. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a terrible cold. Uh, I'm representing Nima, and uh, I, I'm s Nima is speaking in opposition to. One particular section is A5.203.1.1.1, and it's regarding the color temperature of uh, outdoor lighting that Mr. Raymer just referred to, uh, restri restricting it to 3,000 K or less. And we, we've submitted written comments um, on September 19th, and also back in February 21st, we also submitted written comments that quoted a number of studies uh, that have been done. And <clears throat> So we have two concerns. Number one, we're concerned that there's not a technical substantiation for this provision, and there's not an in industry consensus. And you can, you can clearly see that if you go online or if you look up, if you if you take a look at those studies. That's number one. And number two, this will affect uh, pedestrian and vehicular safety. So we really are we really feel that needs to be addressed uh, more than it has been. So. 
and even speaking in opposition. And uh, thank you very much. Brief comments. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Uh, Jack Sales. Good morning. Um, my name is Jack Sales. I'm here to speak in support of 3,000 degree Kelvin or less. I wear many hats. I speak for many groups of, cal of California citizens. As a result of my outreach of California chapter and International Dark Sky Association, I feel the pulse of these groups. I started this in 1993. Citizens of California, members of neighborhood associations, environmental groups, astronomy clubs are asking what to do about the bad blue lighting or LED lighting. It all started with federal funding at the re end of the recession. It started with Cree in about 2006. And um, I think you have a letter from Jim Benya. He makes note of looking at the SPDs of those first LEDs. I think we saw the same chart, uh, the great blue spike, and we uh, were very concerned about it. <coughs> we have we just have the same thing taking place with in the, L in the LED age as a CFL age. People do not want the blue light. First CFLs were, uh, with a high CCT were rejected. Cheap CFLs from China and with high CCT uh, flooded the market. The same with LEDs and LED fixtures. People come to me often about, quote, the damn LED lights the city or PG&E just put in. Recently, people from Neighborhood Association the City of Sacramento have come to me. Members of the Environmental Council of, Ca of Sacramento have come to me. Everywhere I go in my outreach, and we we're just preparing for another one this week, Earth Day, Astronomy Day, um, environmental events, I get the same story. So. Why 3,000K? Why, why not 2,700K? Why not 2,300K? Yeah, you're going to have to wrap it up in about 15 seconds. Oh, okay. International Dark Sky Association addressed this issue in October 2009. That's how long we've been working on it in a, in a news release. It's a common issue with, with the environmental uh, okay, well, th group. Thank you. thank you. You have to wrap it up now. Your time's up. This was just in the, yeah, in the newspaper this Your week. Time's up. Thank you. Let's, anyone else in the room? Come on, it, again, if you, if you have a comment, please come up. And you have to identify yourself as a court reporter. I'm Nancy Clanton, CEO of Clanton and Associates. I'm a fellow of the Illuminating Engineering Society, fellow of International Association of Line Designers, fellow of U.S. Green Building Council LEAD, and I would like to be in support of the 3000 Kelvin initiative. My comments are mostly geared around the NEMA reporting or the NEMA docket um, because they quoted some of the research that I had done and it was misapplied, so I want to address that. The 2014 um, NIA study, which was performed by our firm and Virginia Tech Transportation Institute, quoted in NEMA's um, docket number 222653. The first item is based on roadway visibility at speeds of 35 miles per hour. 
when the object is 250 feet away from the driver. It is not based on hardscape lighting or what the Cal Green is about. It's for this high speed visibility. Therefore, referencing this roadway visibility sections of the studies is not applicable to general hardscape areas. The NIA study also shows that a lower CCT preference in the subjective evaluations from pedestrians. The study also summarized um, three other cities studied by Clanton and Associates and Virginia Tech Transportation Institute, including San Diego and San Jose. In the San Diego study, the 3500 Kelvin CCT significantly outperformed the higher CCT light sources. In both San Diego and San Jose, subjective evaluations from pedestrian participants significantly preferred the lower color temperature. The DOE study that the NEMA also referenced is also focused on street lighting and not general hardscape applications. But I'm here mostly to talk about the new study by Virginia Tech Transportation Institute, which was funded by Southern California Edison and the Illuminating Engineering Society. They conducted a study about visibility in parking lots. This study is currently under final peer review, but the researchers have presented their findings to the IES Roadway Lighting Committee 2018 spring and fall meetings and also at the 2018 IES Street and Area Lighting so Conference. To wrap up too? You bet. Okay. So their findings basically say that there's no statistically relevant data that showed there were visible performance differences between 3,000 and 5,000 K light sources in the parking lots. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in the room? Michael Simonis. Yeah, I was going to say, you can fill out cards, you know, but go ahead, Michael. <laughs> Commissioners, thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Siminovich, uh, professor at the University of California, Davis. I'm the uh, Rosenfeld Chair in Energy Efficiency, and I'm director of the California Lighting Technology Center. Thank you. Um, I'm in support here today of the 3,000 Kelvin recommendation. Considerable scientific data currently exists indicating that light at night can be a significant issue in terms of circadian disruption, leading to poor health and wellness outcomes. And I'm attaching a series of references to my, um, to my, my package. In addition, both Nancy and Jim will provide further direct insights uh, into this equation. Two well-known recognized organizations, the International Dark Sky Association and the American Medical Association have adopted recommendations for 3,000 Kelvin. After much criticism and discussion, the AMA has just reaffirmed this position. Today, I'd like to speak about some near-term practical experiences that we've had with this uh, movement towards 3,000 Kelvin. Both Jim and I were heavily involved with the city of Davis by request a few years back on their street lighting initiative moving from um, 4,000 Kelvin to 3,000 Kelvin light sources. The initial uh, 4,000 Kelvin deployment there was a considerable le level of community concern, glare, stray light, um, and we were asked to, to, to look into this. Our primary recommendation initially was to move to 2700 Kelvin with more refined optics. Uh, we went ahead with a series of studies and evaluations and surveys, and overall the community support was quite good uh, to, this, to, this, to this movement. Um, while not perfect, it was a positive move forward. And some four years later, there haven't been any issues associated with safety, accidents, complaints, lack of visibility with this movement. Um, in addition, we are very involved with the pathways and parkway lighting, which also navigated to, to 2700 Kelvin. And again, uh, good community level uh, of engagement. And again, with no accidents um, or, or reported sa safety issues. I really wanted to get to the heart to the, of this, though, ho however, and the real issue today is uh, with the proposed standard is really about attribution and cost. Um, and moving from, from 4,000 to 3,000 Kelvin in the past 
there were attribution and cost issues on this which, which li limited sa savings. We've gone through a fairly detailed um, analysis of this and on a very large retrofit project that we're involved with now, there is approximately a 3% differential in efficacy, no cost difference. So this essentially negates the issue associated with attribution uh, preferentially driving color, higher color temperatures, which is really the, 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 is really the, the heart of this. Um, for good public policy, uh, just to finish up, is that the best step forward today is to be prudent and to be careful and try to do no harm and do the very best that we can do today. And 3,000 Kelvin is an incremental good step to, to, to the future. With attribution and cost largely being an issue of the past, we should really nav navigate to the 3,000 Kelvin. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. I think we have one more person in the room. Please come forward and identify yourself. Good morning, and thanks for the opportunity. My name is Jim Benya. Uh, I submitted prepared remarks that you can read at your leisure. I thought I had five minutes, only having three, I'm going to have to abridge them. I'm a registered professional electrical engineer in California, directly responsible for the design specification of over 100,000 LED streetlights in California as consulting on over 500,000 nationwide. Uh, I rely heavily upon the publications of the IES, of which I am a fellow, and various articles and papers from reputable sources. We retain Dr. Alan Lewis for our, some of our projects. He is one of the principal researchers involved in the stuff that Nancy mentioned. I served on the board of directors and the technical committee of the International Dark Sky Association. And in 2009, I was among the people who first identified the extraordinary problems of LED lights and helped publish the paper in 2010 that Jack talked about. I believe in a number of key points that you can read about here. But probably the most important one of all is that I have been supporting the 3,000K limit. We have been using it in every project we've been designing for the last 10 years. And to support something Michael just said, there's no cost penalty, there's no performance penalty. There are no situations that we have found where there's any reason not to set the 3,000K limit with a couple of exceptions. One of those would be sports lighting where there is a particularly professional and collegiate level. Other than that, and maybe a couple others like outdoor, outdoor retail, uh, 3000K works just great. Remember, we've been living with high pressure sodium for 50 years at 2200K and a color rendering index of 20. At 3000K and a color rendering index of 70, we get better visual performance and visual acuity and probably like it a little bit better too in many applications. I happen to live in Davis where the 2700K streetlights are just fine. It was a community choice. In fact, I helped design and build a test bed in Hemet, California where we have 150 different LED lights. The community and representatives of, of governments throughout the area toured the installation and gave us data, feedback, <laughs> And what they liked, 3,000K and 2,700K were the winners. So overall, for most applications that I know of as a professional engineer, 2,700K, 3,000K, and lower are just fine. And in some cases, lower, we're looking at 2,200K in historic neighborhoods to help recreate the sensation of the gas light that was, that was there when they originally were built. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? And let's go on the line. <coughs> uh, anyone, please, on the line, Mr. McGarren? Is that Michael McGarrigan on the line? If you are, go ahead. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Great. Thanks. Uh, this is Michael McGarrigan. I'm the director of the policy and ratings department at Energy Solutions, and I'm on the 
phone today on behalf of uh, PG&E and the California Investor Owned Utility Codes and Standards team. And I uh, just wanted to uh, support the Commission's effort to move forward with the uh, 3,000 Kelvin limit um, and uh, provide additional support for the comments that we just heard from uh, Nancy and Michael and Jim. Um, I don't have uh, anything further to add. I just wanted to go on, on the record and say that uh, we think the Commission's moving in, in the right direction um, with that proposal. Thank you. Anyone else on the line? Okay, then staff, would you please respond to the various comments that were made? Please the criticisms. So staff had received uh, the letters from NEMA uh, and we did review the sources that they cited and came to the same conclusions as the expert uh, witnesses just uh, came to that uh, their claims are not supported by scientific evidence in those sources or elsewhere that we know of. Okay, in terms of um, Rob's various comment, a, a few c comments. Yes, please respond on the specifics. In particular, on the, the um, Mr. Raymer's comment on uh, the editorial change he's asking for. Um, actually, I, I can <coughs> I can speak to that very briefly. Um, we understand the note to be explaining what the language before it actually is stating. Uh, so we don't see that as being uh, a substantive change if we were to use the word exception rather than the word note. So I would actually ask our council uh, in order to accommodate that comment, would, is that something we can do at the dais? Uh, technically, that's a non-substantive change. Uh, we can do that at the dais. Then, then actually, I would recommend that we uh, make the change that Bob Raymer did request. So I would just suggest when you're ready to vote <coughs> to make sure that the vote reflects that you're voting upon um, the item with this proposed change, which was to change it from a note to an exception. Thank you. So let's transition to the commissioner, Alistair. Um, so thanks. Uh, you know, I've reviewed this in, in detail. Um, this, uh, I just want to set up just a tiny bit of context here. Um, you know, part 11 is uh, a mix of voluntary and mandatory, and we are only talking about the voluntary pieces that, that are under our purview here at the Energy Commission. Um, so uh, that being the case, you know, really the dynamic here is the virtuous cycle that we often talk about with local governments where they can, ch or you know, variety of local governments already do this um, based on Calgreen or some other criterion, but um, Calgreen makes it relatively straightforward for local governments to say, okay, well, we're going to go beyond the code in, in ways that make sense. And so we've kind of sussed that out, what makes sense and what are the reasonable steps forward that they can make beyond code uh, according to their own context and their own stakeholders and their own, you know, analysis um, and climate, et cetera. And so uh, when they do that, then we learn about how it's gone and, uh, and, and can actually um, benefit for, from that experience and build that into the you know, next iterations of code, wherever it makes sense. So uh, you know, Cal Green, you know, it, it particularly now that we're focusing on decarbonization and really trying to push the envelope um, even further uh, in this broad policy um, direction, uh, Cal Green becomes, I think, even more of an of a interesting tool to help that help that happen. Um, so a lot of the conversation here has mostly been with the lighting requirement. I absolutely, <coughs> I mean, this is actually an improvement over, over you know, 50 years of standard practice. So, um, uh, and, 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 you know, L LED is a vast, fast moving marketplace, but I think we know a lot, and we know enough about it to make this change, um, and uh, that it's all uh, positive. So uh, with that, I support adoption of item two with, with the proposed change from note to um, exception. Great, I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Pass five to zero. Thank you. Let's go on to item three. How is that? There we go. Good morning, Chair Wisenmiller and Commissioners. 
My name is Elizabeth Hutchison. I'm representing the Office of Compliance Assistance and Enforcement, where we offer compliance assistance services and investigate and enforce violations of our appliance energy efficiency standards. Our legislative authority, Senate Bill 454 of 2011, provides for assessing monetary penalties for violations of our appliance energy efficiency regulations and also established the appliance efficiency of enforcement subaccount to deposit these penalties, funding our program as well as this upcoming uh, agreement. Our regulations require the enforcement testing of appliances to ensure energy efficiency savings are achieved. We inspect and test these products offered to California consumers to determine compliance with applicable standards. This testing provides for the key compliance goals of ensuring that manufacturers are complying with appliance energy efficiency standards, investigating and following up on public and industry complaints, and maintaining a level playing field by reduc reducing unfair competition. We currently hold an agreement with California State University Sacramento's Engineering Lab through University Enterprises, Inc. to perform enforcement testing of these appliances. To date, they have successfully tested 225 appliances, of which 61% have failed. This testing has resulted in 99 closed enforcement actions, totaling over $5.6 million. However, there are some appliances that they do not have the ability to test, such as wall and window air conditioners, because they require specialized environmental chambers for testing. We have built a strong working relationship with Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories, also known as LBNO. Their team has demonstrated the willingness and ability to take on these tests, which will allow us to continue our enforcement efforts and ensure compliance of these high energy consuming appliances. I am here to ask for your support today to, pr to approve a three year agreement with LBNL in the amount of $225,000. This contract will run parallel to that of our already existing CSUS testing contract. Our experience managing that contract for the last five years will ensure this contract will, with LBNL will move forward efficiently and successfully. In addition, this contract will continue to strengthen the relationships that we have built with our university partners. Staff recommends approval of this agreement, allowing us to continue this productive relationship with our neighboring universities and supporting the effective work that we have been doing. Thank you for your time and consideration. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Is there any comments from anyone in the room? Anyone on the line? And you know, let's, let's transition to the commissioners. I think let's start and transition to Commissioner McAllister. Thank you know. I was just going to say, obviously, enforcement is a key part of regulation. That uh, you know, it's sort of one thing to have adopted the regulations and really, you know, start changing things. But frankly, unless we have enforcement, it doesn't matter. So again, very important word. Appreciate everyone's efforts there. Yeah, so I just want to thank you and, and uh, Paul and the team. Um, I think um, this is really a success story. You know, it took us a while to kind of get our heads around actually implementing this enforcement authority with under 454 and, um, you know, with a couple of iterations and some ideation, lots of stakeholder involvement, and I think it's uh, we've really landed in a place where it's very effective. That 61% number, I just kind of want to point out that that's not reflective necessarily of the whole marketplace of all uh, there are regulated devices, but we get a lot of tips, um, and there's sort of a competitive environment there, so we tend to kind of bounce from sector to sector as, as, a, as we identify problems. So really, that's sort of a squeaky wheel number. Um, and uh, I want to just give kudos again to the process and Kirk and the, the legal team on this that just do an amazing job um, getting to settlements and being reasonable. And I hear from uh, uh, you know, entities that have actually been fined and paid a fine uh, to the Energy Commission, and they actually speak positively of the process, <laughs> which is qu quite a testament. Um, and, uh, and then also I just want to point out, you know, we have this authority in the appliance realm in Title 20, um, Title, yeah, Title 20 uh, Appliances Efficiency Regulation, but we don't have it in Title 24. Um, and yet we are being asked to do um, sort of market improvement, to spearhead market improvement and enforcement for particularly for existing buildings and retrofits and HVAC and things like that. So, um, you know, I'm hopeful that although it's a different realm, um, we'll be able to um, learn from this experience and inform the legislature as they, you know, periodically consider extending our enforcement authority uh, to the buildings themselves. So, um, you know, not sort of projecting any particular path there, but I think that, uh, 
as we really need those savings and existing building upgrades, we're going to have to think about how to how to be have a little more teeth in the marketplace for that. So, uh, I think this success story really paves the way nicely. So, thanks for that. And uh, obviously, I support this contract with LVNL. Okay, so I'll uh, move item three. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, this item passed five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go on to item four. Good morning, Commissioners. Ron Yasny of the Efficiency Division's Local Assistance and Financing Office. This item addresses Ecolone 002-18-ECD to the City of Hayward. Staff is seeking approval of a resolution approving this loan agreement and adopting the associated CEQA findings. This loan is funded through the Energy Conservation Assistance Act, ECA, to the City of Hayward located in Alameda County to install a photovoltaic system at the City's water pollution control facility. The project benefits include annual energy savings of over 1.4 million kilowatt hours, a reduction of almost 500 tons of greenhouse gas emissions, and estimated annual cost savings to the city of almost $134,000 in electricity. Based on the loan amount of $2,150,955, $950,955 at 1% interest and estimated annual energy cost savings, the simple payback is a little over 16 years. Staff reviewed all CEQA documents prepared by the City of Hayward and determined that with the addition of mitigation measures to biological resources, that CEQA requirements will be met. That additional measure has been included in the loan agreement. Given that, staff has determined that this loan complies with ECA program requirements. Staff council and sightings environmental staff and I are here to answer any questions you may have submitted for your approval. Thank you. Well, let's start with, is there any comments from anyone in the room? on the line. No? Okay. So let's change commissioners. Commissioner McAllister. Um, so thanks for the presentation. Um, I think um, you know, knowing the staff that evaluates these projects, I'm confident that they've done a good job. Um, and you know, this program has a great track record. And obviously the city of Hayward is uh, um, a, a valuable uh, participant in the program. So um, I'll support or I'll move item four. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So this also passes five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go into item five. Okay. Good morning, uh, Chair and Commissioners. I am Rizaldo Aldas with the Energy Generation Research Office, Energy Research and Development Division, and I'm here to request adoption of CEQA findings and your approval of an EPIC um, grant project with ICF Incorporated LLC for a project called Camdenville Biomass to Energy Project, also known as the Forest Biomass Business Center Bioenergy uh, Facility. This project is a technology demonstration project recommended for award under uh, the EPIC Bioenergy Competitive Solicitation GFO 15-325. Uh, Energy Commission staff has reviewed the lead agency, County of Yuba Planning Commission's initial study and mitigated negative declaration and conditional use permit 2017-0003 for the uh, Forest Biomass Business Center Bioenergy Facility and has determined that the proposed project presents no new significant or substantially more severe environmental impacts beyond those already considered and mitigated. In this project, the team of ICF Incorporated, along with Com uh, Comptonville Community Partnership, Phoenix Energy, and other partners will design construct and demonstrate a three megawatt innovative biomass uh, power plant in Camptonville, California. The biomass power plant will use a robust uh, biomass to electricity technology based on standard boiler turbine system technology integrated with advanced emission control and state-of-the-art low water use condenser. 
the project proposal received uh, support letters from five air quality management districts in the region. And the project will uh, help address the goal of mitigating uh, wildfire uh, threat by consuming 30,000 bone dry ton of woody biomass annually. This biomass will be uh, derived from dead and deceased uh, trees and forest byproducts uh, harvested in public and uh, private lands in a uh, forest uh, biomass near uh, Camdenville, California. I request your approval and uh, ready to answer any question. Uh, Camdenville team is also here and on the line to uh, uh, answer any question you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Let's start with public comment from those in the room or on the phone. Um, I think the first one I was going to say is Babcock Power. Good morning. My name is Rhonda Poulter. I'm an account executive for Babcock Power Incorporated. Um, I'm here on behalf of our Babcock Power Environmental organization to express our thanks and support to the Camptonville Community Partnership for the opportunity to deploy our multi-pollutant catalytic reactor technology known as MPCR on a community scale as part of the Camptonville Biomass to Energy Project. Joining me via teleconference, I have members of our Babcock Power Environmental team that have been supporting the project the past two years supporting Kathy LeBlanc and Regina Miller. And if I can um, pass that over to them, I've got Kevin Tupin, who's our Director of Boiler Performance Engineering. I've got Jason Hutchins, who's a Manager of Process Engineering. And I've got Suzette Pusky, who's our Principal Business Special Development Specialist. And I believe, Suzette, if you can hear me, um, I'm going to pass this over to you. Thank you. Yeah, open it, we'll hit that, and then we'll go back to folks in the room, please. Please go speak. All right, thank you. Uh, this is Suzette Pushki. We do believe this project is, is urgently needed to provide an economically viable means for the disposal of excess uh, forest biomass to reduce the wildfire threat. We do, uh, the technology we're offering, the multi-pollutant catalytic re uh, reactor, will control NOx emissions as well as CO and VO emissions, reducing emissions by more than 70% compared to a standard direct combustion system. And um, we do believe the technical risk for this type of project is less compared to alternative um, projects offered and is easier for the community to off, um, operate compared to gasification systems as well as more forgiving to the variables in uh, feedstock that may be uh, burned in the system. We do believe it'll, uh, it's the project will establish a replicable model for other biomass utilization plants throughout the state. Great, thank you. Let's, let's go to Comptonville Community Partnership. Hi, my name is Kathy LeBlanc. I'm the Executive Director of Camptonville Community Partnership. On behalf of the community of Camptonville, I would like to thank the CEC for considering us for this award. Camptonville is a, a community of about 700 people nestled in the Sierra Nevada foothills who may be economically distressed but are mightily powerful in their ability to persevere. It is from small towns like this that amazing things happen. We conceived the idea for this biomass to energy project in December of 2012 when Camptonville Community Partnership attended a Yuba Watershed Protection and Fire Safe Council meeting. The path from that simple beginning to now conceals countless enormous steps to get our project to this point where I'm standing before you. The five goals of this community driven initiative are to create local employment reduce the risk of catastrophic wildfire, enhance forest health, reduce air emissions from open pile burning, and produce renewable energy. We have been extremely grateful and proud that our community of Camptonville received one of the two awards 
given in this category for $4.9 million. This grant award is a very significant achievement for the Canterville Project and supports adoption of similar technologies across the state with the aim to improve forest health, reduce air emissions, and reduce water consumption. It will also reduce the risk of catastrophic wildfire by utilizing dead and diseased trees and forest byproducts. As Mr. Aldas has informed you, we were chosen for this EPIC grant in March of 2017 to fund the design and construction of an innovative 3 megawatt biomass power plant in Camptonville. Since then, we have met all the obligations put forth by the Commission, and the project is poised to receive our PPA and soon after will begin construction. The project will be implemented by the Canterville Community Partnership in, corporation, in collaboration with Phoenix Energy, ICF, Center for Sustainable Energy, University of California Davis, Babcock Power Environmental, Direct Contact LLC, and DE Solutions. It is through the effort of numerous individuals and organizations working collaborative, collaboratively that will bring this project to fruition. It is with this funding that and that collaboration that we can now begin in earnest to construct a three megawatt forest biomass to energy plant in the Yuba hip foothills, which will offer up to 25 sustainable living wage jobs and potentially cut Camptonville's unemployment in half. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go on to Phoenix Energy. Good morning, Greg Stangle uh, with uh, Phoenix Energy uh, here in support of Camptonville. I want to talk to you just for a brief uh, moment uh, about your investment here. Um, I've been in this business since 1999. We've worked on bioenergy projects on four continents. Uh, the first one we ever built start to finish was done in six months in Poland. In California, our average length of a project takes six years. In order to withstand that, you have to have a team of fighters. And what I want to tell you today is by backing Camptonville, you are backing a team of fighters. In this state, we have really struggled. It's the best place in America to do this and the worst place in America to do this. You have a utility which has almost with religious fervor opposed this program, delayed it for years, and yet Camptonville keeps pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And I'm just here to say, how important that is in safeguarding your investment that you really picked a team of fighters. And we have also made your staff fight. Rizaldo, Alicia, Lori, and Linda are, are, are probably really tired of taking our calls. Uh, and we put them through their paces. And uh, I, I'm just, uh, I'm here to tell you and to say thank you again for all that the Energy Commission does in this space and particularly with this project and to assure you how strongly in this we are in support of, of, of this community and their ability to get this job done with your money. So thank you very much. Thanks. Let's, anyone else in the room? Then let's go to the, the phone lines. Open the, could you open the phone lines? I think we'll, we have three folks on the line. Let's start with the board member of the Comptonville Community Service District. Hello. Hello. Please identify Hello. yourself. My name is Richard Descard. I am a board member of both the Camptonville Community Service District and the Camptonville Union Elementary School District. Go ahead. Did you get that? Yeah. Uh, go yes, ahead. we did. Please just just speak. Okay. Um, I um, would like to uh, encourage uh, the proposed Woody Biomass to electric system project in our district in Celestial Valley, California. It, um, as noted, uh, and I think this is a, an issue, Camptonville is a California state designated severely disadvantaged community. So in support of the Camptonville Community Partnership, uh, I would concur that the biomass facility would create local sustainable jobs, which would be a great benefit to our economically disadvantaged rural community. And 
and note that over the last twenty years at our town hall meetings employment has been a major priority secondarily which has been pointed out the facility would use the byproducts of you know the local sustainable forest management as feedstock and our hope is it will create a new market for the forest biomass and will also offer a possibility of creating other job opportunities from new industry using excess heat from the as I understand it from the biomass facility us folks here in Campton they'll sort of hold our breath from all easily May until October these days in fear of wildfire catastrophic wildfire is a constant threat to our community and the local ease ecosystem fuels reduction will decrease decrease that risk and it will increase the health of the forest and watershed and the Cantonville service district contains watershed for Bullard's Bar Reservoir an important element in the California water plan so improving the health of the watershed gives more water to the state and as pointed out already the biomass plant would improve regional air quality by not only decreasing smoke from wildfires but also by reducing the amount of forest residue that is currently deposed disposed of through open pile burning and I can tell you it's a very notable you have ash dropping down around you so thank you and again hope you can be supportive of the Cantonville Community Partnership and its program okay thank you let's go to the Yuba Water Agency generation facilities in the Yuba River watershed the primary watershed that will benefit from the proposed bioenergy facility Yuba Water Agency fully supports the bioenergy facility and I would like to point out some specific water related benefits that would result from the implementation of the facility forest management that would result from the biomass market created from the facility will provide water quantity increases by returning the forest to a more natural condition this benefit would run through the Yuba watershed to the Feather and Sacramento Rivers and all the way to the Bay Delta. Healthy, well-managed forests are a part of the overall solution to California's water needs. The bioenergy facility will also ensure that water quality is maintained by decreasing the likelihood of major sediment and debris inputs to our reservoirs that would result after a major wildfire in the area. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I think last we have a representative of Sopa Wheeler Company. you hear? Yes, please go for it. Thank you. Um, good morning, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak in support of the Campsonville Biomass to Energy Project. I'm Paul Violet. I'm Vice President and Timberlands Manager for Sofer Wheeler Company. We are a 114-year-old family-owned tree farm based in Yuba County. Um, we manage approximately 40,000 acres of timberland that would be tributary to this facility. Um, I can say that in my 32 years of experience here at Soper Wheeler, um, the greatest challenge we face is the safe disposal of forest debris from small tree thinnings and logging operations. Currently, we are shipping biomass all the way to Anderson, California. It, that's an eight-hour round trip by uh, chip van. Um, this facility will meet our needs for biomass disposal protect the regional watersheds as noted already and improve forest health in the region. Um, we are fully in support of it and as a side I am also a Camptonville resident and I'm particularly pleased with the design inclusion of advanced air pollution controls and the low water consumption condenser design. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak in support. Thank you. Anyone else on the line? Please go forward, Hello. identify yourself. Yes, good morning. My name is Randy Fletcher, and I'm the county supervisor for the foothills area of Yuba County, 
and vice chairman for the board of directors for the Yuba Water Agency. I'd like to overwhelmingly express my support and that of our board for the Camptonville Biomass Facility. Last summer, the Cascade Fire burned nearly 10,000 acres, killing four people and destroying 265 structures in Yuba County. Based on what we saw in Santa Barbara and Sonoma counties, it could have been much worse. There is no doubt that fire is incredibly destructive, not just to our homes and our forests, but to our watersheds as well, impacting water quality, costing millions of dollars in debris and sediment removal. We believe the Camptonville Biomass Plant will create a regional market for all the forest waste material that would otherwise just be hazardous fuel and it sparks sustainable forest management practices to reduce our fuel load. The biomass plant is a tool that makes forest management work. The forest waste material can be brought to the plant and be used to generate electricity. It encourages sustainable projects, creates jobs, and improves the region's air quality. This project ties in beautifully with our efforts that we have underway that can help us get a healthy watershed and a healthier forest. For those reasons and many more, we offer our support to the Camptonville Biomass Plant and encourage that you do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the line? So let's transition to the commissioners. I will say it's really heartening to see the broad support here. Uh, you know, it, that this can be an opportunity to move forward. I mean, frankly, back in 78, probably the first cogen projects, a lot of them were forest products. Uh, you know, and they were certainly very strong projects. Uh, the industry went through tougher times. I mean, frankly, it spotted out in the 80s, decimated a number of projects. Uh, remember, I did the due diligence for Chrysler Corp. One of the number of projects they invested in, uh, they're gone. So. You know, again, bottom line is this is not easy, uh, but it's really great to see the energy and willingness to go in and try to do it. Anyone else? No, I just, um, it, it's great to see the amount of support the project has. It's obviously very important, and we hope it's e extremely successful. So I'll go ahead and move approval of this item. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Decided and passed five to zero. Okay, good luck. Go forth. Let's get it done. Okay, let's go to six. Good morning, commissioners and stakeholders. My name is Anis Bahrainian, and I'm with the Energy Assessment Division here to recommend awarding the California vehicle survey project to the resources systems group. Uh, Energy Commission periodically conducts a survey of California light duty vehicle owners to assess shifts in consumer preferences for both conventional and alternative vehicle technologies. The survey is unique in a number of respects, including its coverage of both commercial and residential market segments and its integration of the revealed and stated preferences surveys. The survey collects data on both revealed and stated preferences of California consumers in six different regions of California representing the entire state. The stated preferences surveys are still relevant because of the evolving nature of the zero emission vehicle markets, which do not yet offer vehicles in all 15 classes of light duty vehicles. Energy Commission uses the survey data to build and update light duty vehicle choice models that are used in forecasting demand for conventional as well as zero emission vehicles in California. The survey and the model contain analytical tools to conduct a range of policy analysis and assess the impact of different policy measures such as fee rates, rebates, tax credits, fuel tax, and other incentives designed to move the state towards its goals. The light duty vehicle demand forecast can be used in assessment of fuel infrastructure plans, uh, fuel 
tax revenues, and others. The plug-in electric vehicle forecast is also used to pr predict transportation electrification in California and assess progress towards state goals, as well as the impact of PEVs on California's electricity loads into the future to assist with infrastructure planning. Previous survey reports have been shared with public on, on the Energy Assessments webpage <coughs> And hundreds of entities in the state, in the nation, and across the globe have, in sectors like government, academia, utilities, and automotive manufacturing, have accessed the anonymized survey data to build their own models and conduct their own analysis. The Energy Commission, Caltrans, and CARB staff have been collaborating in previous rounds of this survey, but for the first time, CARB has also co-sponsored the 2018 2019 survey project. The funding for this project is a split between California Energy Commission and California Air Resources Board. CARB plans to use the survey data in the 2020 Advanced Clean Car Program rulemaking process, as well as the ZEV regulation and uh, ZEV incentive redesign to make, uh, more effect to make them more effective in promoting the ZEV vehicles. Um, Resources Systems Group has been selected through a competitive solicitation process, and uh, we recommend awarding this contract to RSG. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, uh, the, pre the president is trying to interrupt you, apparently. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> yes, that was scheduled for 11.18, and indeed it is 11.18. Yes. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, Let's first see, uh, is there any public comment? Yes. Please. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Melanie Zauscher. I'm with the Research Division of the California Air Resources Board. I'm here to provide support for the California Vehicle Survey and to confirm CARB's uh, commitment to provide co-funding for this important effort. The results of this survey, as Annie said, will provide valuable and timely insights into the impacts of regulations and incentives in the vehicle market and will inform CARB's future regulatory efforts to reduce vehicle emissions and the design of future clean vehicle incentive programs. We also want to express our appreciation for all the staff working with us on this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so certainly the Air Board support is very important with this project. Uh, anyone else in the room or on the phone? Let's transition commissioners. Commissioner Scott. Sure. Um, I am in strong support of this project. I appreciate the California Air Resources Board for being here and also for uh, co-funding this information. Um, one of the things we've really needed to update in our survey is the um, the look at the zero emission vehicles and, and um, the infrastructure and things that go along with that. So I'm really pleased that we are um, shifting this to have the robust level of data that we've had for internal combustion engines also for the zero emission uh, vehicles within this. So I'm in strong support and we'll move approval of item six. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item six passes. Thank you. Let's go on to the minutes. I need to abstain from the minutes because I was not here on the 21st. Okay. I'll move the minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So it's four to one with one, that one being abstention. Okay, lead, lead commissioner reports. Commissioner Scott? So um, it hasn't actually been that long since we last <laughs> met, but uh, <laughs> Commissioner Douglas and I have had a chance to um, travel the state. Um, we went to see uh, China Lake, visit the Naval Air Weapons uh, Station there in China Lake, and also to visit uh, Point Magoo, uh, Port Mynimi. Um, and so that was really fantastic. It was a, a great chance to see what um, our partners at the Navy are working on, what's important to them, learn about the missions at each of those uh, bases. So a couple weeks ago on Thursday and Friday, we were out in uh, China Lake and had a chance to see uh, the, the PV solar systems that they have there, which is, is really great. One of the things that they are looking to be able to do is add storage and really good battery management systems along with that. Um, and uh, they're also very interested in microgrids as well. Um, this, of course, is for resiliency's sake, um, but these are things that we're more than happy to partner with when there um, are opportunities. It was interesting as well because um, in uh, Point Magoo, Port Wainimi, and uh, San Nicolas Island, 
They are also looking at, uh, you know, San Nicolas Island's got the wind. Uh, they've got about seven windmills that are there. They're also very interested in storage and battery management systems to go um, along with that. Um, so I think that was kind of a theme that we heard from uh, both visits. But, you know, and, and one, as you know, China Lake is out, out in the middle of the desert. Um, so kind of getting some information back from them about how solar panels do and weather and, you know, 120 degrees, no rain. <laughs> um, are they really resilient? And then um, or, 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 or what, what challenges do they have there compared to the ones that are sitting right on the coast, right, in um, Point Magoo and, and other areas? So I think there's a lot of great um, opportunities for data exchange there as well. And then on uh, in the Port Wainimi, Point Magoo, San Nick, they're also doing some desalinization. Um, and so being able to, to put that in at times when there is excess power um, is, is really interesting and something that I think they're interested in as well. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, electric vehicles, a little bit about offshore wind, but I'll let uh, Commissioner Douglas fill in there. But I um, very much appreciate our, our partners at the Navy for warmly welcoming us. And um, we had a really enlightening um, tour of, of both areas. Um, yeah, so we met on September the 31st, I think it was, <laughs> so, or no, 21st. <laughs> um, so uh, since then, really, I just uh, I've done one kind of major trip. Uh, spent last week on the road, uh, first in Detroit at the the NASIO uh, annual meeting. Uh, so as usual, just a great event. Lots of DOE people there. Lots of kind of program discussion. Lots of um, uh, just exchange between the states. And really, that's uh, you know I say this over and over again. But uh, you know when we join NASIO, we really do get a lot for it. Not just the DC kind of view of things and, and keeping up to date on legislation there, but also we get to exchange, you know, robustly with all the other states. And there are many, many interesting, you know, we're not, we are, you know, the center of the energy universe, obviously, we all know that. <laughs> <laughs> Tongue in cheek, let the record show. Um, but um, uh, you, other states uh, at a smaller scale are doing wonderful things. And, and so um, I really appreciate that forum to uh, have sort of a peer-to-peer -peer exchange about everything. And, you know, people's jaws drop because there's an extra zero or two on everything we do but um, in terms of funding levels but um, they are innovating um, in, in their own ways I mean, in New York Connecticut Massachusetts uh, some of the Midwestern states on weatherization are doing pretty amazing things and so uh, Utah is doing a lot of good stuff so anyway I, I um, spent uh, first half of the week there and then went into uh, went to DC uh, to participate in an inter-american development bank Inter-American Development Bank um, kind of regulatory visioning um, process, um, and you know, was the only kind of U.S. representative there, and they had flown in regulators from all over Latin America um, to talk about how to improve their regulatory environments. You know, and it's incredibly varied from Chile, which has you know it's pretty on top of things. Mexico is getting there uh, with their reforms, which are you know very well done so far. Uh, but many countries that just really haven't begun the process of professionalizing or to the, to the extent they need to to really uh, open up their markets in a way that's well regulated. And so they very much appreciated uh, our presence there and expertise on programs and you know, how to sort of march forward in, a, in a, a coherent way for the long term to give the market certainty that when they do regulate that, that it's got some teeth and it's actually going to be around for a while. Uh, so I guess my point here is just that even across the hemisphere, uh, people are looking to California for experience, um, and that's why they invited us to that, uh, that forum. Um, and um, so anyway, I thought that was very, very worthwhile, very helpful, and a few, a few um, you know, potential collaborations uh, with, with other countries. I think they, uh, we might see a, few, a couple of delegations out of that work. Um, and then uh, finally, let's see. Um, Went to the Alliance to Save Energy Stars of Energy Efficiency Award Ceremony. Uh, first time I'd been able to go to that, even though I've been on the board for a while. Um, and just, you know, very DC, you know, kind of insider baseball in a way, but also just it's really important to award the big, the big investors in efficiency and in clean energy. And, you know, Target got a big award. You know, they had senators from, from the home states of the awardees, you know, um, stepping up. Senator Klobuchar, who's been in the news lately, and Senator Shaheen from New Hampshire, who's been a leader in efficiency. Uh, really rely on the alliance to, to uh, keep engaged with what's happening in the energy efficiency world, and then they are they turn around and they are great supporters. And so I think the the alliance um, at at a high level is very uh, useful for keeping uh, you know again sort of keeping track of what's going on in Washington, but also really moving the needle and, and making sure there's a bipartisan stakeholder process 
that uh, helps navigate all those uh, turbulent waters at times. So uh, anyway, that was my last week. Thanks. So I'll just briefly add on to Commissioner Scott's um, update, uh, which is the, the, the trips both to China Lake and to Point Magoo were in, in Port, Port Hainimi were, were really valuable. And um, we, we learned a lot. And um, in particular for me, it was really helpful. It was my first opportunity to go to Point Magoo and really get a better sense of what they do and the geography of the area and um, how that interacts with the whole conversation around offshore wind because Point Magoo is um, given where offshore wind could occur on the central coast. Um, uh, among the military installations that's, that could be impacted or more likely to be impacted. And so that conversation was really valuable. And, um, and I really all of them were. So I think that's, that's my report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just with your permission, I wanted to say a few words unrelated to the Energy Commission, which is last night I watched the President of the United States uh, mimic mock and ridicule uh, a victim of sexual assault. And I find that unconscionable to the point where I can't let it go unnoticed or unchallenged. I just feel there's a line of egregiousness that gets crossed here. And while our you know, mission at the Energy Commission and the, is building a, a cleaner and healthier and uh, more sustainable energy future, um, we all have a role to play in building a more compassionate society. And uh, I just hope that uh, we've hit now finally hit the bottom, <laughs> that uh, this kind of thing never happens again. Uh, because this woman that he attacked, um, you know, uh, has had threats on her life, has had to move out of her house. She's had higher security. Um, she was clearly terrified when she spoke before the Senate. And I regard that as a second assault you know, to do that verbally. And it's just unacceptable to me. And I, I um, went to bed angry, woke up angry. Um, and uh, I just feel a line has been crossed. And um, I really think we all have a role to play in, you know, getting this country in our public discourse and our public behavior uh, back to a better place. Um, so thank you for letting me <laughs> get that off my chest. Um, on uh, a, a happier note, uh, last night uh, my advisor Tara was able to, to join in uh, an event congratulating Diane Grunick on her long and storied career in public service and, and read a toast and gave her own toast as well uh, in which uh, we thanked her on behalf of all of us for uh, really inspiring uh, uh, the next generation of young people uh, to get into public service and try and make things better. And, um, I, uh, I hope many, many folks can follow in her, uh, in her footsteps. Uh, and on a personal note, um, some happy news. I went to my cousin's wedding uh, last weekend in New York City. He's an actor. And uh, I had been the ring bearer um, at his parents' wedding you know, 40 something years ago. I applied for the job uh, again, uh, arguing that I was, uh, had the requisite experience and a record of success, and I, I felt that he actually owed everything to me. Um, but uh, he gave the job to someone younger and more beautiful and less experienced, uh, my daughter, uh, Sonia. Uh, so I, I still told him, now I know how it feels to be an actor in New York City. Um, so that was a real highlight uh, for our family. But uh, with respect to Energy Commission um, work, uh, we are going to do everything we can to include storage in the eligible equipment list, working with Drew and others on that now. And I'm sure you all saw the governor signed SB 700, which adds another $800 million to the SGIP uh, program. And I think we'll highlight storage as an important um, technology going forward. And then um, Commissioner McAllister and I both spoke, though, at different times at this new coalition, uh, the Building Decarbonization Coalition, founded by Energy Commission alumni Panama Bartholomew, which was a terrific consortium of folks in the building sector and um, uh, energy efficiency community uh, in Oakland. And I, I think they're going to do some great things as a, as a group. Um, I'm going to be meeting with Admiral Lindsay as well this week. The Fleet Week is happening. And I really want to thank the chair again. You know, During his whole tenure, the focus on building the relationship with the military has been so valuable. Um, and I just am so proud uh, that we've got that going under your leadership. And, and Admiral Lindsay, I think, is also really grateful. I've, I've just built a rapport with them. I was down um, 
just on my personal time at the Miramar Air Show uh, for my dad's birthday. So I talked to some folks uh, there. Uh, and then I'm, I'm speaking at a wind conference tomorrow and a storage conference Friday in San Francisco. And then I'll be going to France uh, for an EPRI electrification um, conference uh, just for a couple days in uh, November. So that's my update. Great. Thank you. No, I think following up on your comments, it's obviously really important to us that in terms of workplace values, that it's pretty clear there are things we don't tolerate here in terms of discrimination and that we're really looking for a, you know, an environment where everyone can you know, work together and prosper. You know, I just, as I said, no t zero toleration for those types of things around here. A um, couple of things, I mean, one is on China Lake, I was gonna note the solar systems you saw, Jackie and I were there for the groundbreaking for those, uh, so it certainly brings back memories. Um, and also on the microgrids, uh, it turns out that was a phenomenal debacle with Edison on the interconnection studies for the microgrid at China Lake that Kevin and I spent a couple years trying to untangle. I think eventually China Lake just buried the idea, but um, it's a shame. It would be certainly be good if there's a way to, to, to resurrect it, but again, it's, there's at least some issues on the interconnection side that shouldn't have been, but are certainly whether things are better or worse now, it's hard to tell. Uh, so a couple of things I was gonna mention. One was I went last week to the NCPA 50th anniversary event. And you can imagine how jazzed they were. It was, it was down in Monterey. I, was, I gave a talk that was more on fire issues and built more off of the fourth climate change assessment and what that means on the fire side. Um, so hopefully it scared them to be thinking about adaptation at the local level. Um, and then I went to the IEP Fallen Lake, Lake event uh, this week. Uh, actually with Drew, actually Courtney and Kevin are still there. Uh, and again, it, it's a good opportunity. I, in some respects probably would have liked to have spent more time there, but you know, it wasn't gonna work with me being here today. Uh, but, you know, so it would have liked to have heard Keith Martin on uh, TAXA, uh, you know, a variety of things there. So that was, that was, that was certainly interesting. Um, next week I'm going to Tokyo for a conference, speaking there. Uh, so one of those, you know, short trips, but uh, basically should be useful. Uh, and I was just gonna follow up. Last week we had the joy of handing out some, some money and, or CalSeed and I think one of the things we haven't really talked about what, you know, we're really trying to tighten things up a little bit in the EPIC and to some extent ARFBTP areas. Uh, one of the things that came out of working with RPE, particularly Cheryl Martin, was that eventually you really got into what was going on and past the hoopla or PR side of it. And one of the real differences between RPE and the Energy Commission is they had a really corporate culture, they had probably more flexibility than any, anyone else is ever gonna get to adjust things after awards have been given. But they also had a very conscious thing of saying, okay, this isn't working, we're just pulling the plug. You know, and uh, you know, we were always afraid here that it's like, oh, we let the contract, uh, maybe the contract manager doesn't wanna tell people it's really not working. Uh, but we're trying to get much better of people saying, yeah, here's, here's a yellow light you know, the, there are issues here with the contract, and at some point saying, well, okay, we, we just have to stop work, you know, and, and or cancel the contract because it's pretty clear for whatever reasons is this not going to provide value at the end. And, and it's, as I said, it's a real cultural thing for, I think, for people to be prepared to say, yeah, time, time to pull the plug. I think the other areas where, where we're tightening up is often when people do proposals uh, there'll be a matching fund element which can really determine who gets the money. And then at some point, you, know, you get the question, okay, what's the match? You know, is it real or is it hoax? And if it's hoax, you gotta pull the plug. You know, or tell them, you know, okay, you promised this much of a match, it's either gotta be there or the contract's gotta go. Uh, and the, the final thing, and I was gonna say certainly, before I came to the Energy Commission, I was with two startups and the, the first one didn't make it, and part of it was 
you know, we had actually an attorney who was not who was mathematically challenged, but anyway, he did the bookkeeping and the accounting. So you never were sure whether you were, you know, at the cliff or, you know, you were doing phenomenally well. And so <laughs> when we set up, you know, our, the other firm, we had an outside accountant, you know, and, you know, basically y you were really sure at the end of the day where you were each quarter. And what we're finding, again, and actually some of these are really large companies, is when you look at it and say, well, what is your overhead rate? You know, well, can you document, you know, and it's, it's really different if you have an outside firm do your overhead rate or if you have a mathematically challenged attorney do it. Um, and, you know, and ultimately it's our responsibility to say, okay, what is your overhead rate? What's your, what's your bill, billing rates? You know, how many hours did you work? I mean, just basics. And I think certainly to the extent a lot of these folks are really trying to get through the valley of death and get to a company, I can just tell you from my experience in business, if you don't know those numbers well, you're not going to make it. You know, so it's, you know, the, this one of the skills that we really have to be encouraging our incubators to really make sure people have, understand they, you know, they may not be accountants themselves, but they really have to give professional advice on that, and just as they do on IP issues. So, in many ways, so you're seeing more, more things where we're just looking at and just going, this isn't working, or we're looking at stuff and go, wait a minute, these numbers just don't add up. You know, we're not going to pay based upon phony numbers. And so you hear a certain amount of anguish, but, you know, I think it's our responsibility, really, to the citizens of California to, to make sure the, the money is well spent and that uh, they get the money's worth. Before we move on, Mr. Chairman, would you mind just sharing a little bit of what you, uh, your thoughts on the fire issue going forward, like looking ahead of priorities, some of what you shared at the, at the conference? Um, well, I think the thing that really came out from the fourth climate change assessment is that it's getting hotter, but we'll have a lot more extreme heat days. You know, Sacramento, the analogy that some of our scientists have used is going to be like Phoenix. You know, we're going to go from four days over 105 to 20. You know, and again, it's there'll be years where it'll be like two, and then years that'll be 30. So, uh, and the same, it's a, I'm going to say drier, although in a sense the water is more variable. I guess is a better way of putting it. Uh, and we have these atmospheric rivers in Northern California that we had. Actually, the videos are now at the National Academy, but we had Sonoma Water District gave a presentation. And here's a slide of oil. And here it was, drought ridden, low water, you know, you could see it. And the atmospheric river parks over it. And suddenly, you know, you got this flood. You know, so in, in terms of looking at that, and if you think about it, that combination of heat and variability on the temperature, and plus with the higher temperatures, obviously things like bark beetles survive, that means there's a lot higher fire hazard. And so again, the studies we have done on fire hazard, and I should give you a footnote, was there's going to be a lot of really bad fires. I mean, ones that make 2017, just as we've gone through 2017 was the worst, and then 2018 was worse. There's going to be a lot of worse fires than those going forward. Um, and then the part of the scary part was when we did the climate change assessment, we based the study on 2000 to 2016 data. What well, turns out, 2017 had the same effect as cumulatively 2000 to 2016. So you have a feeling of maybe the you know, that what was happening on the ground was outrunning the science. Uh, so then you get to, what does that mean in terms of forest management, and you know, how do you go through these prevention plans that utilities have to come up with uh, under the Dodd Bill and. The one of the things I know President Picker is really struggling with is we've heard the people from Comptonville say, okay, we're up in the Sierras, you know, and we have a lot of dead trees, and, you know, certainly if you think about what is 130 million dead trees, you know, I mean, that, that can be catastrophic when they all, if and when they all go. You know, right now when you look back at these numbers, the f greenhouse gas emissions and air pollutants that are coming out of the fires swamp our savings. Uh, but anyway, I was saying when you talk to President Picker, it's like, well, okay, we have this urban wildlife interface, 
And fire is there where people die. You know, the fires way up in the Sierras are really bad for a number of reasons, but, you know, probably the historical policy was those fires happened and they just ran along and no one paid that much attention to them in a way. Um, but if you're talking about Redding, uh, you, you know, and really it's a situation with a new normal, you know, in this area and the prevention, you know, and then talking to the utilities, you know, they're, they're terrified in the sense that, you know, PG&E has suspended its dividend. It took a lot of activity, you know, not to have, you know, not to have them go into bankruptcy so far. Um, Edison has not suspended its dividend, but after the legislature passed its, the legislation, both Sempra and Edison were downgraded to PG&E status, uh, which is just above junk. Um, and then, you know, you go out to NCPA and you go, okay, here is Trinity or here, you know, you've got entities where you're going, you know, okay, you're, you're a lot m more connected to the community, but what happened, you know, you know, it's sort of so, we're going to probably going to see staggering rate increases for hardening the, the grid. Um, by the grid, I mean a lot of it's more distribution than transmission. Uh, so it, it's, it's, I mean, it's going to be a huge issue. As, as you know, it's probably the dominant issue in this year's legislature. It's probably going to be the dominant issue at least next year, if not the following year, uh, as people go through. And we're still waiting for the shoe to drop from Cal Fire on the Tubbs Fire liability. Uh, so it, it's, you know, definitely, you know, going through this, we've, we've spent a lot of time in Epic. We've had a workshop, but trying to find out from... Um, basically the PC safety division where they think we need, they need more research. You know, and we've worked closely with um, Commissioner Randolph on this adaptation resilience issue uh, for the utilities. And they're, they're starting out with the electric utilities, gas utilities, but eventually they've got to get to telco. They've got to get the water utility, you know. And uh, we, we are, I'm, pushing a lot to make sure that we're meeting a lot of local governments because not only do you look at the impacts, it's one thing, but there are ways to mitigate this or adaptation and that's very much local land use issues. Yeah. And so, but I mean, it's, it's, it's when you talk to people, just the magnitude of the issue, for example, insurance. Well, the utilities can't get insurance, really. Or, you know, it's like Edison had a famous filing where they got $350 million worth of insurance for roughly $250 million. You know. yeah. uh, so think about it. But then you, you, know, you talk to individuals who are saying, yeah, you know, I've, I've checked 20 different companies to try to get insurance for my house. <coughs> or the you know, vegetation management. I mean, from, from PG&E's perspective, it's the guys in, in the Davy trucks that are really doing the vegetation management. If they're not matching the PUC decisions, pg e gets hammered, so they're trying to shift that to, to them, and they, they can't get insurance. So it's, it's something which will continue to be a crisis for a while, and I mean, at this point, obviously, utilities are trying to really get out in front on this issue and hoping that you know, they can make the changes they need to make fast bef and not have the X fire just happen and, you know, Edison is now in pg e shoes or, you know, throwing the blank, Redding or something, you know. So it, it's, it's going to be, it's really going to be the dominant issue and everyone's really struggling to understand it going forward, but at least from the climate change assessment, the story is it's not going to get any better, it's going to get a lot worse. So uh, it's a dreary story, but I mean, I think, again, we have to be, po you know, the issue but certainly the PUC has raised is that we have more and more people living in these areas of high fire risk. And, you know, if, if you decide you're going to build a house in a high fire risk area, then presumably PG&E has to provide service to you. It's at the same rate as providing it to anyone else. And then if because of that service something goes wrong, you know, again, who pays for that or how do you deal with that? You know, and so at least uh, Michael has at least thrown out the notion of should there be differential rates? And if, if you choose to locate in high fire risk areas, 
you know, should you be absorbing more of the cost of doing that or the risk of doing that, I guess is a better way of putting it. Uh, so anyway, it, it, again, it's probably, you know, it's sort of remarkable we've got as much progress as we did out of the legislature in, a f in an election year, but they all understood, I think, that they took what was the necessary steps but realized it was such a complicated issue that it's really going to be dominating, I'm going to say at least next year and or the following years. And that's, that's just one of the climate impacts. You know, frankly, sea level rise, you know, we, um, in terms of flooding, erosion, you know, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, you know, we've used that, s that slide and that quote that those folks of us who've been studying climate change are now living it and experiencing it. Yeah. So, but anyway, it's going to be huge for California for a long time. Um, Chief Counsel's report. No report, thank you. Executive Director's report. No report, I just want to briefly say thank you for taking the time to acknowledge Sylvia Bender. She's one of these people who genuinely doesn't like to have the camera turned in her direction, but I think she was really pleased. And it also sends a nice message to staff. You probably noticed that the room was pretty filled with a whole bunch of her uh, folks who watched her lead that group for the last couple decades. So thank you. Yeah, no, I've obviously been the lead on electricity and natural gas through my time here. And so spent a lot of time with Sylvia. It's always been a joy. Um, Public advisory report. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Rosemary Avalos, and I'm representing Alana Matthews, the public advisor, and I'm going to be providing the public advisor's update. The public advisor's office continues to receive a wide variety of telephone and email inquiries. There has also been a number of staff workshops, both at the Energy Commission and off-site, supported by our staff. And we continue to work on long-term outreach projects for fuels and transportation, energy research and development, and the Renewal Energy Division. And the special activities um, that Alana has attended are the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco in September of last month. And she started with the kickoff event co-sponsored by Commissioner Hochschild, which featured a conversation with Al Gore. Alana also attended uh, many summit events, and here are a few highlights. A session with Alec Baldwin, Dr. Jane Goodall, and Paul Pullman, CEO of y Unil Ever. She attended an event featuring Dr. Mae Jemison, the first African-American female astronaut, who reminded the attendees to look up and to be mindful of the connection between the cosmos and our climate. Alana also says she's proud to have served as a delegate. And she also asked me to show you this nice baseball cap <laughs> that reads, Make the Earth Cool Again. <laughs> yeah. And then with the SB 350 Disadvantaged Communities Advisory Group, the group met on September 28, 2018, where they selected, developed, and adopted an emergency equity framework, which is available on the Disadvantaged Communities Advisory Group webpage. They also selected three key priorities to review and make recommendations on. One of the priorities is the Energy Commission's Energy Equity Indicator Tools. The other two include the CPUC's Environmental and Justice Social Justice Action Plan and review of the current proceedings within each agency. And the next meeting will be posted soon with more information. And looking ahead, the Summer Institute of Energy Law and Policy students will be special guests at the upcoming VERGE conference and will have opportunity to participate in the VERGE microgrid tour that showcases the latest technologies in distributed energy generation, battery storage, and smart energy systems and their ability to pro provide standalone, reliable, cost-effective power generation and management. And the students will be able to have hands-on um, activities working in with the microgrid. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any public comment? This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>